Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. One of the most well-known attributes about God among common conversations in humanity is the fact that God is a being of love. John 3.16 has been called the golden text of the Bible as we consider that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but might have everlasting life. But have you ever considered that God also wants something back from us? God wants us to love him. You might wonder, a being that has everything that created the world, why would God want my love and how would I give that love to him? What does God want me to do to evidence or to show that love? When we look at one of the occasions at the end of Jesus's life in Mark chapter 12, we have a picture of what God wants and our love for him. Let's study together to see what that looks like and what Jesus says about our love for God. God is a being of love. First John 4 and verse 8 says that God is love. The truth that God loves us is shown in that he created us. He also provides for us. He sacrificed his son for us. And he gave us a plan of salvation so that we could be saved from our sins. The mind may be impressed with how much God loves humanity, but our heart should also be disappointed sometimes and ashamed with how little people love God. Some people wonder, what does God want from me? And what does God want from you? So many people wrestle with this question and have wrestled with it. The commands of God are not burdensome and God is not hard to figure out. In Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, the people wonder, what does God want? Does he want sacrifices or rivers of oil or the sacrificing of their children? But God says in Micah 6 and verse 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, John writes that the commands of God are not burdensome, but this is the love of God, that we would keep his commandments. In the last week of Jesus's life, among the other things that Jesus dealt with was the three questions that he, were, he was asked in Mark chapter 12. The Pharisees sent a group of people known as the Herodians to Jesus to ask him whether taxes should be paid or not. And Jesus answered that we should render to God the things that belong to him and to Caesar, the things that belong to him, Mark 12, 13 through 17. And next, Jesus was approached by the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. They drew up a scenario to trap him, and he answered their questions and also assured them that humans do, in fact, rise from the grave and that the death that we experience as humans is not the end in Mark 12, 18 through 27. And lastly, a lawyer approaches Jesus and asks him, which is the greatest commandment of all? You know, rabbinical sources had tallied up the commands of the Old Testament and concluded that there were 365 negative commands and 248 positive, totaling as 613. Surely they believed Jesus couldn't narrow the command down to just one. But without hesitation, Jesus referred to the book of Deuteronomy and says, you need to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second commandment is like it to love your neighbor as yourself in Mark 12, 29 through 31. While Jesus did not intend to break the human love that we are supposed to have for God into separate component parts of human nature, he simply meant to love God with all of our being. We should acknowledge this can't be done without the separate parts of our human nature. Do you love God? How do you show this love? When you look at what Jesus says in Mark 12, 29 through 31, it's important for us to take what he says and notice that what God wants from us more than anything else is our love. God loves us, but he wants us to love him back. We should love God with our emotion, with our intellect, with our service to others and with our service to him. What does Jesus say in Mark 12, 29 through 31 that would help us in our desire to love God? Number one, Jesus says it involves our emotion, that is to love God with all of our heart. Mark 12 and verse 30. Jesus says the first thing we need to do is to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul. God wants us to love him with all of our heart, which means we must do it with our emotion, with our heart, with the deepest recesses of our being and who we are. Now, there is a difference between emotions and emotionalism. One is natural and the other is an act that appears to be religious and appears to be moved, but is actually insincere. In Colossians chapter two, verses 20 down through verse 23, Paul talked about wheel worship and individuals who appeared to afflict the body and to go through various motions and things, but their hearts weren't really in it. 
the old law called for God's people to love him with all of their hearts and with all of their souls and to keep his commandments is what Moses commanded God's people in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. If we simply do what God has told us to do, but our heart is not in it, the relationship will die. God wants our obedience to his commands, but he wants it to flow from a heart of love. Here are a few questions. Why do you want to obey God? It's because you're simply afraid of going to hell. And while that's a great motivation to begin with, it's not enough to sustain a relationship with him. Jesus taught in Matthew 10 and verse 28 that we should fear God who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And fear of God is a great motivation to begin our walk with God in obedience. But there must be more to it. Or maybe you obey God because you're good at keeping the rules, the do's and the don'ts. In Matthew 23, Jesus praises the Pharisees for their knowledge of the law. But the reality is all of us will eventually fall short of perfect precision obedience. Or is it because you genuinely love him? This is what God ultimately wants. He wants us to obey him from a position of love. First John 4 and verse 19, John says, we love him because he first loved us. In a Huffington Post article about why marriages do not last anymore, at least as long as they used to, one of the reasons they gave that got my attention was that we're more connected than ever before and completely disconnected at the same time. They said we order flowers through an app, we text in the same house, we don't have the face-to-face -face contact, and the emotion is often drained from our relationships as a result. You know, this can happen in my relationship with God. I can sing the songs and pray the prayers and partake of the Lord's Supper and yet not really love him because there is no emotion to the relationship. It's just business and never personal with us. But when it comes to our relationship with God, our love for him is always personal and never just business. Jesus said that acceptable worship deals both with our actions and our attitudes. In John 4 and verse 24, Jesus says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Both Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16 tell us that we're to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but it's to be done with a spirit-filled attitude as the melody is made in our hearts. We should sing the roof off of the building when we assemble to worship God, when we realize who we're singing to. These are not funeral dirges, but praises to God, and we must put our emotion or our whole heart into it. Do you have an emotional response to God merely from this idea that, well, I'm just sort of going through the motions? Or is it what Jesus talked about in Matthew, Mark 12 and verse 30, that you love him with all of your heart? Is there genuine joy in your heart when you think about God? Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Philippians 4 and verse 4 tells us to rejoice in the Lord always and again to rejoice there's so many things in our lives that stir our emotions and bring us great joy. Think about graduations and marriages and the birth of children and various things we enjoy as far as recreation and sunsets and shopping and sports. And none of these things are bad in and of themselves, but they should not stir our emotions and our admiration more than our love for God. When are you happiest? Is it when you're praying to God and worshiping him, meditating on thoughts about God? The book of Psalms is filled with statements that deal with our hearts as the writer expresses his open love and admiration and devotion to the God of Scripture. Psalm 18 and verse 1 says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Or Psalm 103 verse 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This idea of loving God with all of our hearts is important. This is the first thing Jesus says as he drives at this idea of the greatest commandment. This is something we need to be teaching to our children, that they not only know what God wants from them and know the commands in Scripture, but know why they are to do so. You know, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, when he says we're to love God with all of our hearts and soul and mind and strength. But right after that, in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, Moses told the children of Israel, and these commands which I give you this day, you're to teach diligently to your children and talk of them when you walk by the way, when you sit in the house, when you lie down and when you rise up, they'll be like frontless before your eyes and you'll bind them as a sign on your hands. What were they to teach? What were they to bind? This idea about loving God. Our love for God, number one, is shown when we do it with all of our hearts. But number two, Jesus says we're to love God with our intellect. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul. But then the second thing that Jesus says in Mark 12 and verse 30 is to love God with all of our mind. 
You know, so many people simply want to have this emotional response to God, but that's not all that is involved in loving God. Surely God wants us to love him with all of our heart and soul, but we need to love God with all of our mind as well. Does God have your mind? Do you love him with it? Loving God with the mind deals with how I treat and respond to his word. The way that God has communicated to us is through scripture. Question to ask ourselves would be, are you a student of the Bible? Have you committed yourself to reading and studying the word of God so that you can better understand and appreciate God and comply with his will? Notice a few passages in the Bible that emphasize the importance of studying scripture as a response to God and loving him. Psalm 1 begins by saying, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The word of God has been cherished by his people down through the ages. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Psalms, but also the longest chapter in the Bible, emphasizes the word of God. The psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 97. He said the word was sweet to his taste, sweeter than honey to his lips through his precepts. He found understanding and it caused him to hate every false way. The word was a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. Psalm 119 verses 103 to 105. To only pick up the Bible on Sunday or leave it behind in a pew with no plans of ever looking at it again until the next time we're in a gathered assembly is not to love God with all of our mind as we should. We may say, I love God, but if my Bible is stuck to my dashboard, or if I must go on a scavenger hunt for it on Sunday mornings to find where I last placed it, then I may be failing to love God with all of my mind by disregarding his word. Jesus challenged people who merely gave lip service to him as the son of God in Luke 6 and verse 46. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, it's going to be hard to know the things, it's really impossible to know the things that Jesus has said without taking an honest look at Scripture. Jesus says to love God with all of our minds, which involves looking into Scripture and seeing what God has said. We need to be like those in the Bible who committed themselves to learning what God has said and then doing it and putting it into practice. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10 describes Ezra as an individual who is a restorer of God's law. He came back with the rest from exile and he saw that God's word had been neglected. And so Ezra 7 and verse 10 describes him as a ready scribe. For Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra first sought the law of the Lord, then he practiced it, and then he was able to teach it to others. He was loving God, but it began with loving God with all of his mind. One of Ezra's contemporaries, Nehemiah, was also an individual who was involved not only in rebuilding the walls and the structure of Jerusalem so that God's people could worship him, but Nehemiah 8 and verse 8 says, they read out of the book of the law distinctly and gave the sense, and it caused them to understand the reading. Jeremiah praised God's word in Jeremiah 15, 16, when he says, God's words were found and I did eat them and they were the rejoicing of my heart. God promised to put his law into our minds in the new covenant. But first, we need to give our minds over to him. Two times in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10, and Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16, we read, God says, the new covenant is going to be different. I'm going to write my law on their minds and put it on their hearts. And if you think about the individuals that we mentioned previously, Ezra and Jeremiah and then the days of Nehemiah and how they were committed to the word, how much more should that be true of those of us who live under the new covenant? The reality is you and I are as close to God as we are to the Bible. No one is close to God who is far away from his word. You may say I'm a person who doesn't like reading, but the Bible is a book worth reading. Pew Research recently did a study that was released two weeks ago, and they found that 75% of Christians say that they believe the Bible is the Word of God. 42% say reading the Bible is important to them personally, but yet only 35% read the Bible at least once a week, and 45% of the people that claim to be Christians seldom or never read Scripture at all. You know, we can't treat the Bible like most people treat birthday cards and still be pleasing to God. Most people open up a birthday card, they disregard the words, and they're looking for what's going to come out or whether or not there's a prize. The Bible is the prize. The Word of God is the way that we connect with Him intellectually as we love God with all of our mind. Does your mind belong to God? 
Do you love him with all of it? Just think about any realm of life, any category of life. Would someone believe that you were a fan of a popular show, maybe Law and Order or something like that? If you never watched any of the shows, you knew none of the characters. Would somebody mistake you for a Harry Potter fan or a Hunger Games fan if you've never read any of the books and you don't know the storyline? We couldn't fool people in those regards or thinking that we were a sports fan, an avid sports fan of a favorite team if we were unfamiliar with the, the schedule or with the mascot or maybe even with some of the most popular pro players. And we can't fool God into thinking we love him while we know very little of his word and never read it or really study it and take no time to internalize it. Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48, he that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The words that I've spoken, these words will judge us in the last day. Now, those words are either fearful for us or delightful, depending on how we responded to the word of God. You know, today there are so many ways to learn the Bible and to get the word of God into our minds. We can listen to the Bible on audio. We can listen to it as we're driving to and from work. We can get on a reading plan and digest the word in smaller increments as we can digest it and pull away for private time to study. We can attend worship assemblies and go to Bible classes and learn collectively with other individuals. This is how the Bible was read in the New Testament church in the first century. Colossians 4 and verse 16, Paul writes about the Colossians reading the epistle that he gave them in the presence of others as well. Ronald Nelson, high school senior, he was accepted to all eight Ivy League schools upon his graduation. But, you know, he turned them all down to go to the University of Alabama. And no, he was not a football player, but he felt it was a better decision since they offered him more financial aid assistance. They were paying all of his tuition. And some people might say that Nelson is wasting his mind and his brilliance by not going to one of these great Ivy League schools. However, those who have access to God's word but do not commit to diligent study of it are making a greater mistake. We do really waste our minds when we don't give it over to God's book. Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I also will reject you. Seeing that you've cast me off, I will also forget your children. We need to engage with God not only from our hearts and souls in worship and our feelings toward him, but also in our intellect or in our mind as we allow scripture to shape our thinking. What a shame to live in a land with various Bibles and reliable translations, to be surrounded by Christians or to be a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years and never grow in knowledge of Scripture, to never really learn the Bible. Second Peter 3.18 says that we're to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul Reber is a professor of psychology at Northwestern University, and he was asked whether, what is the physical limit to how much the human mind can retain and remember? And he responded by saying the human brain is made up of about one billion neurons, and the neurons combine to help with our memories. When comparing the brain to a digital video recorder, your brain can hold up to three million hours of TV shows or to leave the TV running continuously for more than 300 years to use up all of the storage we have. Now, that may be confusing to grasp, but suffice to say, we have more than enough room in our minds to intake the word of God. Proverbs 7 verses 2 and 3 talks about keeping the law of God on our minds and the law in our hearts. And this is what Jesus is driving at when he says we're to love God with all of our mind. Our love for God involves our heart and our soul. It involves our mind, but it also involves our strength or our service. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and thirdly, our strength. This is with our might and our ability. Our lives should be used in the service of God if we truly love him. This means Christianity will naturally take up some of my time and I will have to use my energy to serve God. Christianity is not primarily about what we get, but what we give. Jesus said in Mark 10, 44 and 45, whosoever will be the greatest among his disciples must be a servant. Just as he, the son of man, came not to be served, but instead to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You read the book of Acts and you read about the early church and all of her needs. And they were fulfilled by men who would step up and serve. There were all sorts of ways to step up and serve in the local church then and now. You can think about Acts chapter 6 and the widows that were being neglected in that daily distribution of bread and that benevolent need. And they selected seven men among them that were able to get out and to lead in that service project. And we might think about ways that we can use our strength to the glory of God today. 
Romans 12 and verse 1 says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Whoever gets our energy and our time gets our love. We need to be sure we give ourselves to God first and not be comfortable with giving him the leftovers of our energy. Romans 6 and verse 13 talks about submitting our bodies over to God as willing servants in his service. Do we love God with all of our strength? When we go out to eat, how do you determine if a waiter or a waitress has been good at his or her job? You might wonder how often have you seen them? How many times have they made themselves available? If they just show up to bring your order to take the check, their tip will probably jingle rather than fold. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, Paul talks about his life as a servant, and he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Yet not I, but it was the grace of God that was within me, and I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul lays his work next to the other apostles, and he says he diligently worked. He loved God with all of his strength, with all of the vigor that he could muster. Is God receiving your strength? If you're a young person, you should offer God your youth and serve him now and not wait until some later time in the future. You could help in the kingdom of God by using your talents for him right now to teach and to help and to serve. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8 talks about the natural decline of the human body. As Solomon writes that you should remember the creator now in the days of your youth before the wicked days come and the evil days draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. And he begins to describe how these bodies will just naturally give way and decay. And the only way to make the best use of them is to use them to the glory of God while we have the opportunity. In the day of judgment, the words that we all want to hear are the words that Jesus gave in Matthew 25 and verse 21, well done, good and faithful servant. But the truth is, you can only hear those words if you have really been a servant. How do I know if I'm a servant loving God with all of my strength? Well, we might ask ourselves, am I doing whatever is asked of me? That's what a servant does. And do I do it without complaining? Philippians 2 and verse 14, Paul says, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Servants are on their master's mission and not their own. John 8 and verse 29, Jesus says, I always do the things which please my father. Servants are rewarded in proportion to what their master has, and we should appreciate that the heavenly master owns everything. Psalm 50 says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and because of that, we will be rewarded in proportion to what our God has, and that should drive us and motivate us to serve him with all of the vigor that we can muster. Jesus says, love God with all of your strength. It's tempting to give all of our strength, all of our energy to everything else in the world and to neglect that which is ultimately most important and that's our service to God. Love God with all of your heart and soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And then Jesus added on a fourth one in Mark 12 and verse 31. He said, we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The Pharisees had asked Jesus about the greatest commandment, but Jesus linked these two together and really adds in this second one free of charge. It comes from Leviticus 19:18, where the children of Israel received the law of Moses. And in Leviticus 19, he's talking about all of those various relationships and how the law was to inform the way they treated others. And Jesus shows that loving our neighbor as ourselves is equally important to loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. He says the second commandment is like it. The world is all over this command. People in our world care little sometimes or nothing about the first command, but they often want to jump to the second. And they say, well, I just want to care about people and love people. You know, that's not the way Jesus set it up. This is a wrong approach. We can't skip God and merely focus on humanity. But we also need to be careful that we don't simply focus on the first command without doing the second. Most people understand the idea of loving their neighbor and how this makes sense. Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Luke 10, 25 through 37, one occasion, a lawyer asked Jesus, what's the greatest command in the law? And Jesus said, what is in the law and how do you read it? And he said to love the Lord with all of the heart and soul and strength is the greatest command. It's more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. And the second command is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you know, that's right. If you do that, you'll live. And then the man responded, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus introduced what we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan about a man going down and falling among thieves and being mistreated. And a priest and a Levi walk by and they're really of no help to the individual that's in bad shape. But then a Samaritan comes 
And the Samaritan steps in and he does for that man what the priest and the Levite were biblically trained to do. These were people that had loved God with all of their heart, with all of their soul and with all their mind. And in the hour that a man needed the most, they didn't step in and help. But, you know, the Samaritan stepped in and cleaned the man up and poured oil and wine in his wound and carried him to an inn where he received great treatment and care. He paid for the man's stay. Jesus taught him the parable. And then he said, whatever more he needs, when I return, I'll give you that as well. The reality is everyone is the good Samaritan when they can choose their neighbor, but God says we can't. We're to love everyone that way to the best of our ability. The way we treat our neighbor is ultimately the way we treat God. Does this excite you or worry you? The way that we're treating other people is the way God views our treatment of him. They're made in his image, James 3, 9 and 10 says, and so it matters. We love God through loving others. And we need to learn how to love God through loving others. People need to see our light shining based on how we treat them. The Bible assumes that we love ourselves. And places like Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, we're told that no man ever hates his own flesh, but instead nourishes it and cherishes it. And we're to love our neighbor just like we love ourselves. We might wonder who is our neighbor And we might think about doing some great work and maybe going overseas and reaching people that are in dire straits or in need. But, you know, the reality is our neighbors are closer in proximity than we might think. Our children and our spouses, they're our neighbors. And are we bilingual? Do we talk to people in the world one way and maybe talk to people that live right within the same house with us a different way? What about people that we work with or people that we encounter in various service stations like fast food workers or people that mess up our orders? Do we treat them the right way and realize that they too are our neighbors? Maybe we're caring for an aging parent or maybe there's a person that we are engaged with at school. All of these individuals are our neighbors. And you know what Jesus says? To really love God as we should is to treat those individuals the right way. In Matthew 7 and verse 12, Jesus said that, At the end of the day, what we should do is to do to others as we would have them to do to us. For this is all the law and the prophets. This is what it's all about, is to treat other individuals in the same way we want God to treat us. If we love God, we'll love the people that God has made in his image. Romans 13, 8 says that there's no other command greater than this. We don't owe any man anything else but to love him with everything that we have within our being. It's the purpose or the aim of our faith. First Timothy 1 and verse 5 says, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. God loves you. The Bible tells us this much. God's love is shown in that he created us. He provides for us. He sent his son to the cross on our behalf and provides a plan of salvation by which we can be saved. And what Jesus teaches in Mark chapter 12, 29 through 30, is that God wants us to love him back. Thank you for watching Light of the World today. Perhaps you have questions or comments about what you've heard. We welcome your thoughts. You can reach us by email at lightoftheworldbgky at gmail.com. You can also give us a call at 270-843-8435. We'd love to have you visit with us at the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ. We don't have all the answers. We don't even live perfect lives or pretend to. We're trying to look up to Jesus to be a light and our God. We'd love for you to join us. We look forward to seeing you right here next Sunday at 1030 on WNKY. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Keep looking at the light. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Let me see.